you may be seated. All right, let's go to the book of Proverbs tonight, chapter number 17, if we could. Proverbs chapter number 17. This was taken from an article written about 40 years ago, but there's still a lot of significance with what's being said in it. It goes like this. Now, there's evidence based on interviews with children and grandparents that children need their grandparents and vice versa. The study shows that the bond between grandparents and grandchildren is second in emotional power and influence only to the relationship between parents and children. Grandparents affect the lives of their grandchildren for good or ill simply because they exist. Unfortunately, a lot of grandparents ignore the fact to the emotional deprivation of the, of the young. Of the children studied, only 5% reported close, regular contact with at least one grandparent. The vast majority see their grandparents only infrequently, not because they live too far away, but because the grandparents have chosen to remain emotionally distant. These children appear to be hurt, angry, and very perceptive about their grandparents. One of them said, I'm just a charm on grandma's bracelet. Positive roles that grandparents play are caretaker, storyteller, family historian, mentor, confidant, negotiator between child and parent, and model for the child's own old age. When a child has emotionally, or a strong emotional tie to a grandparent, he enjoys a kind of immunity. He doesn't have to perform for the grandparents the way he must for his parents, peers, and teacher. The love of grandparents come with no behavioral strings attached. The emotional conflicts that often occur naturally between parents and children do not exist between grandparents and grandchildren. Whether you're a grandparent now or will one day, Lord willing, be in the future, the role of a grandparent has a lot of value that can be used for the glory of God. Proverbs 17 and verse 6, the Bible says, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Children's children are the crown of old men. Let's consider that thought tonight as we talk about godly grandparents. Let's have a prayer, word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight. I pray that you would help me to be able to speak in a clear way, that, uh, that it would be helpful. Regardless of the status here of, of uh, people, uh, we do pray that you would just meet needs tonight in a special way, even if it's on a subject that's not even related. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I think about my own grandparents, and I've had a real privilege, I, I, I guess I kind of take for granted sometimes, is that I've known several of them. And, and what I mean is grandparents, great-grandparents, and even a great-great-grandmother. I had the privilege of knowing. In fact, I didn't lose my first grandparent until after my wife and I were married. And I think we had been married at least a few years, if I remember correctly. I still have, I still have um, one set of grandparents that are still alive. I had one just pass away here this past year. But to think that I, I, I especially on my dad's side, I knew my grandparents. I, know, I knew my grandma and grandpa's parents, my great-grandparents, and then I knew one of the great-great-grandparents. Grandmas. And I thought, well, I, I, I never, I guess it was just normal for me to know those people. Then I start talking to other people who, you, you didn't even get to meet your grandpa or your grandma or, or, or anybody like that, much less to have that far back. And I, and I feel very privileged in that regard. I remember staying with both sets of my grandparents, though. Uh, they both lived on farms. They were rural people. And, and there were times where I stayed with them and uh, I would help out as best I could. Um, especially uh, uh, my dad's side, they lived a little closer, and I would bale hay and straw and do all that kind of stuff. And I bought pigs from them and, and did all that, those kinds of things. My, uh, or at the very least, I went around exploring their properties. I remember trapping gophers, and, and uh, there was a little car that my, it was my parents, somehow my grandpa got it, and they let me drive it around the, the uh, fields. And I remember driving one time, it was like a little Honda Civic, and I think I hit a pothole and my head hit the ceiling, something like that. <laughs> but you know what? You can do that at Grandma and Grandpa's house, uh, right? And nobody will tell anything. And I had a lot of fun with them growing up. I, uh, one, I remember my grandma, she always made the best French toast. And uh, la I think it was last summer, we, were, we uh, had gotten together and they were camping outside my parents' place uh, because of a funeral service that was going on for one of my cousins. 
And uh, I said, Grandma, you got to make your French toast while you're here. And she, she did. She helped us out. I remember my other side, my grandma had all these Archie comic books. Some of you remember the old Archie? Uh, man, that, is, that goes way back. But I went there, and I, and I found them. I was like, hey, this is neat. So I'd sit and read them and while I was staying at their house. And my grandma would pull out a stack about that high, I think from my uncles who must have read them. And I, I'd spend hours just sitting there reading, and I'm sure it kept me out of her hair while she was doing whatever she had to do. You know, we, we, went, we went to our grandparents' place growing up uh, for a lot of the holidays, primarily Easter, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. But, of course, as time goes on, you're not able to do that as much anymore uh, as you have to, of course, you, you've got uh, time and distance. And then when you get married, you have the other side that you have to work with as well. But growing up, we used to go down to my grandparents quite a bit, Every, at least once a month, though, because my dad was in the military and uh, he was part of the National Guard that drilled in a, in a city that wasn't far from them. So we'd stay the weekend, and that was always a fun thing to go do. And we were always excited, too, uh, when the cousins would come over. And, and uh, you just have a lot of those types of memories built up over the years with those people. And, uh, again, some of them have passed on now, and... and uh, and uh, I remember a lot of their funerals going to. But they, they all certainly had an influence in my life to a, a greater or lesser extent. And I think everyone here who, who's known their grandparents can relate to that. That you had, they, they've been an influence in your life in some capacity. And you have some memories that you, you can look at and, 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 you, and they're special to you. I, I've been privileged, I was privileged to, to do the funerals of, of both my uh, my wife's grandmothers, and uh, those were special things. And it, it's so unusual to think that my daughter didn't really even know them very well, but we but we had known them for so well as uh, when we were first married, and and just to have those kinds of memories are, are very very special, I think, for for all ages to experience. And if you've got grandparents, that's that's a wonderful thing. Now, in in the Bible here, it mentions children's children. Now, today we would use the term grandchildren to, to identify what's being said here. Grandchildren, here it says, are a crown of old men, of old men. Now, in the Bible, crowns were often an ensign for royalty and victory, and they were often used symbolically for honor or reward. So we get a picture here with what God's trying to communicate in this proverb is that, um, that these grandchildren are, are something special to the old men, or the grandparent, if you will. In fact, it's mentioned a few times of crowns being knocked off people's heads, which, which symbolizes the opposite thing, of it being shame or, or loss. Job mentions in Job 19.9, speaking of God, He hath stripped me of my glory and hath taken the crown from my head. Again, what I believe we see in this verse is that grandchildren are really, in essence, a reward for, <laughs> as the Bible puts it, old men or old, old women. It's, it's funny to think about that. You know, right now, I am the age where my grandma and grandpa became grandparents. That's, I don't know what to think of that. <laughs> I couldn't imagine being a grandpa right now. Or, a grandma, Yeah. But our, our grandma, yeah, I really couldn't imagine that. <laughs> That'd be rough, wouldn't it? Explain that one. But, you know, generations now, you know, are having kids oftentimes later. But, but what we see here is that grandchildren are a reward for older men and women. In other words, it, I think what it's kind of trying to communicate is basically it's an honor they receive for raising their children and seeing them grow up and become moms and dads themselves. It's been said that grandchildren are a reward to the parents who didn't kill their own, amen? <laughs> there always seems, though, to be a special link between grandparents and their grandchildren, isn't there? I mean, how many grandparents like to talk about their grandchildren? I mean, they do. Especially the first ones, right? <laughs> yeah, the first ones. Oh, yeah, look at them. Look at They moved their finger. Wow, that's amazing. You know, all, all this little stuff. I mean, but it's a big deal. You know, they, they always got the kids. You know, back in the day, 
before cell phones when everyone kept their pictures in their wallets. Of course, they dropped the wallet and then <laughs> there were the pictures, right? <laughs> Here's Betty, he, she, she's doing this, and here's Bobby, he's doing that. And, you know, you just list the, all of them, and, and, they're, and they're like a, a little chain there. You know, forget their kids, the grandparents, the grandkids, they can't do anything wrong, right? One little boy described his grandmother as someone who came, comes to visit and keeps your mother from spanking you. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean there you go, right? <laughs> I saw this t-shirt one time that says something like this. My kids wouldn't be so spoiled if someone would just spank grandma. Amen. <laughs> oh, gee, you know. <laughs> I saw this, uh, I saw this uh, one time, and I think I shared it with my mother-in-law. I can't remember, but this. When grandma starts acting up, you know, you got the cage right in there. <laughs> Some of you, if you, you can find that on Amazon if that's what you need. Amen. <laughs> You know, I often joke with my wife that when they go to Grandma and Grandpa's house, it's like going to Disney World, and um, just they get spoiled so much. I think many kids do experience that to a certain level when they go to Grandma and Grandpa's house. They, they, they get a little spoiled, and, and uh, Grandma and Grandpa don't feel the pressure of needing to discipline and keep things in order. They're like, we did that with the kids. That's your job. It's our turn to spoil now, and they have fun with it. And I, I think in all seriousness, they're, they're, that's normal in, in a lot of capacities. But in all seriousness, though, grandparents, especially godly ones, really do have an opportunity to influence their grandchildren in a wonderful way that helps the parents raise the children for the Lord because of that special relationship that does exist between grandparent and grandchild. And there really is that special relationship. Let's consider today what godly grandparents can do to inspire their grandchildren for God. First off, we see that they can be a, a godly illustration, a godly illustration. Now, regardless of one's age and status in life, we are called to be a good example for Jesus Christ, to have a, maintain a good testimony amongst all people. And that's certainly true of grandparents as well. I like how Titus puts it, or Paul puts it in the book of Titus, chapter 2, and verses 2 through 3, that the aged men, grandparents, be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, the aged women likewise, grandma, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. You know, that gives a description of, as, as we grow older in the Lord, that we should be putting that kind of stuff out in our lifestyle and our attitude, I hope that we're all growing in that direction regardless of what age. But, that, but, but uh, we should be, we should be uh, continuing to mature and be a, a true example of righteousness and godliness as we grow. The longer I live, the more I see that not everyone, though, finishes their course faithfully like that. Not everyone is going to be like this, unfortunately. It's easy for some, even in their older years, to fall off. And kind of get lax and say, you know what, I've, I've done my time, so I'm just going to coast the rest of the way. You know, there are some kings that were like that. I think of Solomon. Boy, he started off very well, didn't he? But towards the end there, in his old age, he got, he, he got, he got lax, he got comfortable, and he started doing some very, very ungodly things that honestly set up the country to be split. He, he was the one that really, if you want to put most of the blame, we always like to play Rehoboam, and he certainly had his part, but Solomon set things up for it. Then there was another king by the name of Asa. Asa was a godly king for most of his reign, but towards the end there, something happened. He got bitter at God, and it didn't end well for him. Then there was Uzziah. You know, he, he was strong, uh, a strong kid, a king. He did very well, but then he got proud, and uh, he fell off at the end there. The Bible, again, likens the Christian life to a race. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And again, life is not a sprint race where it's done and over quick for, for most people. Really, life is more like a marathon. It takes time. And it's, it's the long haul, if you will. And 
after running some of those races, I understand how it gets towards the end. You're tired. <laughs> and things hurt. And it's not so easy. But you've got to keep your eyes on the prize till the very end. And that's true for everybody here tonight. You know, maybe you've been faithful for a decade or two or longer. And it's very easy to get laxed in your Christian faith. And, you know, I, I don't need to be a prayer warrior anymore. I don't need to be a soul winner anymore. I don't need, you know, I put in my time. Let me tell you something. Let's have the attitude that I want to put in my time until I die. Until I am done. I'm going to give it the very best. Maybe I can't do what I used to do. But I still want to be faithful to the very end. We don't want to be lax and, and, and fall off at the end there. What a horrible thing to, to, to run the race so well and then give up at the end and not cross the finish line and not get your full reward. What a terrible thing that would be. What a tragic thing that would be. But I know people that, have, that were faithful for a time that fell off. And you know what? Everything they ever did, they, they're going to lose because they, they turned their back or they, they got lax. We don't want to be that way. Again, regardless of the age. We want to be like the Apostle Paul who had this dogmatic determination. Acts 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Let me tell you something. Each of us has a ministry. Whether you're in the ministry or not, you have a ministry that God's called you to do. And you want to finish that course with joy. You want to come across the finish line with your hands in the air. Thank you, Lord. I've watched people finish some of those marathons, and they come in, and, I mean, they're running like lightning speed. I don't think I could sprint as fast as those guys run 26.2 miles. And, and when they cross that finish line exhausted, they're, you know, they, they got their hands in the air cheering up like that, even though they're tired. That's the way I want to finish my Christian life. I want to finish it well. What a joy it is, is to be a wonderful, godly example grandchildren can look up to. What a great, what a great thing. And, and, and what, a, what a wonderful testimony you're living. What, you're, what we say by that is this. Child, it's worth it to live for Jesus. It's worth it to, go, to, to stick with it to the very end. That your faith means something. And they can look up to that and say, you know what, that's something I can aspire to. You know, we're always talking about people needing heroes. I think parents should be the number one hero in, the, in, a, in a family. But you know what, grandparents can be some pretty good ones as well. If they're godly and, and are striving to, to encourage, it, encourage things in the right direction. I think of uh, Mrs. Doherty. I call her Ma Doherty, <laughs> the, the mother of the Doherty gals. And uh, we've had the chance to get to know her a little bit and... And uh, she stayed with us here a couple years ago. But she just has this positive attitude. And she, she's in her, I believe, in her 70s now. But, but she's just got a spirit. She, she wants to, to stay faithful and, and wants to be an encouragement. She's got a lot of grandchildren now. And, but even at our house, when she was here, I mean, she was kind of uh, with the children and just, just teaching them Bible things. I think her Bible's open the whole time, if I remember correctly. I mean, just that kind of mentality. Just a sweet gal. But she wants to finish well, and I believe she very much will. Hey, look, again, we don't want to lose our reward that we may have of the Lord after striving to live for him so long. Second John 1 John 1.8, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that you receive a full reward. The last thing a grandparent wants to do is leave a bad example, especially if they've been faithful all the years. Proverbs 16.31 says, the hoary head as a crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness. Now the hoary head, it talks about the gray head. It's speaking of, a, uh, of an older person. And that hair is representative, of, uh, is, is again, a crown of glory, an honor. If, though, the key word there is if, if it's found in the way of righteousness. Be the grandparent, the grandchildren recognize as a godly lady or godly man. You know, I think of a preacher I know uh, who lost his grandmother not too long ago, but he always, when he talked about her, he said she was always godly, always godly. And uh, that influence has shaped that family. I know that. As I mentioned, children need role models, people they can look up to. 
grandparents with your special relationship. I understand the spoiling and I, you know, have your fun with it. But remember, you do have an influence and you do have an opportunity to really shape that young person as they grow up and be an encouragement to the parents that, you know what, when they go through those bumps and bruises that you went through raising them, <laughs> that you can say, hey, look, just stick it out. Stick it out. You turned out. They can too. Be that example. Secondly, on top of that, being a godly influence. Now, the authority of a parent diminishes as the child grows up and really breaks specifically when the child gets married. The Bible mentions in Genesis 2.24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Again, the breaking of that authority, what's left of it, where the child and, and that is married off and they become their own family. And that's a hard day for many parents. And I'll probably be one of them as well that day when that happens. But it's one of those things that's going to happen. It must happen. What is left after the authority is gone is, is one's influence. As the kid gets over, the, the authority and the influence kind of shift. Where you have, you and I need to strive to have influence in their life. If parents have done a good job of nurturing a good relationship with their children, and that's the key thing is the relationship aspect. Uh, if they've done their best and, and are striving to maintain a good relationship with their kids, they'll have their hearts. And having their hearts, they'll be able to influence their children, their children's spouse, and the grandchildren in a positive way. Now, you can't usurp the parents in this, but at least if you can have that influence in, the, in your child's heart in a positive way, not where you're trying to dictate their lives, but, but a positive influence... You, you can do some good. Again, grandparents don't have the authority to make decisions for parents and should never undermine the parents' efforts in raising their children. Again, it's not their call. But what can be done is maintain or grow a strong personal relationship, and through those things, you'll receive opportunities to give advice that is helpful to the parents. And the parents will feel comfortable in you influencing the children. Now, if relationships are bad, then, the, then guess what? There will be no listening by the parents or the children, even if it's good advice. Now, maybe here today you're a parent, and you say, well, what do you do if grandparents are undermining me as a parent? Well, it's, it's, it's important, especially if the grandparents are lost, to graciously set boundaries. And may I emphasize that we're graciously, folks. We need to be gracious. And make your desires known about certain things. Like, you know, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do that. And we don't need to ram it down them, especially if they're not saved. You've got to be careful with that because, you know, you know there's, there's a careful balance there. But, but, but you may have to set some boundaries. And I believe most level-headed grandparents will respect that. I'm thankful that in our circum circumstances, the grandparents on both sides have been very respectful of what we've desired and have never crossed that, at least not deliberately at all. They've been very respectful and we've got a good relationship with, with them. But if it's really bad where the grandparents won't do that, then it may come down to where you know what, mom and dad are going to have to be more readily present or maybe there needs there can't be as much time in that capacity. But that's a situation that's pretty severe I think. But I, can I say again that we need to maintain a level of respect for those grandparents. In other words, your parents. <laughs> parents. Because the Bible does say, in no less of terms, to respect our elders, right? <laughs> Leviticus chapter number 19, verse 32, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, and honor the face of the old man, and fear thy God, I am the Lord. Parents, if you are fortunate that your kids have godly grandparents, then let them have some influence. There is a heart relationship that, again, is there that is very tender and very special. And if a grandparent is there, and, and you know they're there, they're, they're, they're there to, they don't want their grandkids to go bad, then certainly they can have an influence. Godly grandparents, I believe, will desire to see their grandchildren grow up right, so they'll be a help to you. They will. And as a grandparent, the power of your influence 
has the capacity to go beyond your own life. Jonadab was the father of a group of men called the Rechabites. And God, in the book of Jeremiah, uses the influence of Jonadab that extend beyond his life, really it appears, as an example of the way the Jews were supposed to follow God. And of course, and he gets after him and says, here these guys would obey Jonadab and their father, but you know what? You guys don't even obey me. But look at this. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing, but it, it brings out the power, the influence of, of this man that would go beyond his life. Jeremiah 35, we'll just pick it up in verse number 1 here. It says, The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of the Rechabites, and speak unto them, and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Then I took Jazaniah, I love these names, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazinah, and his brethren, and all his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites. And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdalah, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Massaniah, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups, and I said unto them, Drink ye wine. But they said, We will not drink, we will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Neither shall ye build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any. But all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that we have hath charged us, to drink no wine all our days. We are wives, our sons, nor our daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in. Neither have we vine, our vineyard, nor field, nor seed. But we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land that we said, Come and let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Jerusalem. Now there's, there's some exchange here as God uses the family as an example against Israel. But, but look at verse 18. And Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according unto all that he hath commanded you, therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. Wow. What an influence. And it had an eternal impact on his whole lineage going forward. That's the kind of influence we want to have, a positive one. It starts, of course, with training the children, and then from there, the influence that you have to your children's children, or even possibly to your great-grandchildren, it'll eventually sort of end for you when you pass on, but it'll live through your children. That influence, and that's powerful influence. It can be, as it is in the case here with this Jonadab. May God help each grandparent determine to grow and maintain good relationships so that they can have that kind of influence. And maybe today you don't have that, that relationship. Well, can I encourage you to try to foster it, if at all possible? Try to foster it and try to build it up. You never know where that might go. Well, thirdly and finally, we want to be a godly in, intercessor. Now, as we grow older, it's an obvious fact that we simply will not be able to do which, what we once did physically. That's just the fact of the matter. Right. In fact, you know, even you know, even our minds are not going to be able to withhold the same abilities as they were when they were younger. It's just, you know, our bodies are aging. That's just reality. But it's interesting in the scriptures that there are some great examples of aged people who were powerful intercessors. I mean, they they are recognized as people who knew how to get a hold of God. If you go to Luke chapter number 2, Luke chapter number 2, when Mary and Joseph entered the temple to present Jesus Christ there as a baby, 
there was a lady there, an aged lady. She was well up in years by the name of Anna. And it mentions her ministry. Not a lot mentioned about her, but she was quite a lady, evidently, based on what she did there. It says here in um, Luke 2, verse 36, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, the, of the tribe of Aser. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about fourscore and four years. I mean, she was somewhere near a hundred, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayer night and day. And she, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all that them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Not much said, but there's enough said that gives you an understanding of the type of woman she was. She was an intercessor. She prayed, and God recognized it. It says there was one Anna. That's, that's kind of an interesting title to be placed upon her. There is one Anna. She, she had a special spot. She was an intercessor. And though she was up in years, and, and uh, she was involved hey, look, maybe some of the greatest fruit that you and I will ever produce in life may come in our older years when that's all we can do. I don't know. But the, she, she prayed. Then there was another man who was well in his 90s as well that was a prayer, a prayer warrior and a faster. That was Daniel. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 2, it mentions how in those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. He was an old man at this point. I mean, he was way up there. But yet he was praying and he was fasting, and God would give him one of the most uh, remarkable prophecies that exists in the Scripture. We call it, it's Daniel chapter 11. But there's some very powerful prophecies in there that speak to the the sure-cut validity of the scriptures and how they were fulfilled. But they were, praying, they were praying people. Now, as far as we know, neither of these people were grandparents, but they were aged. In other words, they were older. And they both left an example of somebody who got a hold of God in intercession. Grandparents, one of the best things you can do for your grandchildren is intercede on behalf of them. They, they should be on your prayer list. I'm sure that they are. Over the years, I've had older preachers tell me, you know, when I was, when I was a pastor or whatever, I, I never faced the things that you face today, brother. I mean, I don't know how many times I've heard that. But you know, it's true of your grandchildren too. Your grandchildren are facing things that you and I never faced when we were young. And they need your prayers. Something that will outlive everyone's life here today is your prayer life, which you've lifted up before the Lord. You know, God answers pr the prayers of people even long after they've died. Even long after they've died. And your prayers will outlive you in a tremendous way. Even after we're dead in God, God will still answer those prayers that we've offered up. There really is nothing you can do better for your grandchildren than to get in the gap for them and ask God to work in their lives in such a way that they, of course, are saved and then become fervent servants of him. Fervent servants. Even if your children aren't raising their kids right, quote-unquote, your prayers can intervene your prayers move the hand of God. You know, sometimes because of things that happen, you get you have the grandparents, but the parents, maybe, maybe they're not even right with God or maybe they're not even saved. But maybe God can work in that grandchildren's heart to, save, to get them saved and eventually reach the parent. It happens that way. It can happen that way. All I'm saying is that your prayers really do make a difference in the lives of those kids. Just one of those prayer promises. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. 
hopefully as a grandparent, you're taking those ones you love to spoil to the throne of grace, begging God to work in their lives. Having lived a full life or lived a lot longer than those kids have, you have some experience, you have some insight, and if you've been walking with God, you should know the Lord better to where you can intercede in, in, intelligently and fervently for those people. I remember years ago, we had these camp meetings up in Fargo, and, and I remember an older preacher, he's with the Lord now, but he got up to preach, and, and uh, he, he preached with a lot of passion, and one of the things that he, he preached, and he said, I, I'm just so concerned about the way the country is going for my grandchildren's sake, and he, he, and he was weeping when he was preaching there. And you know, let that heart come out before God. There's nothing wrong with that. By the way, it wouldn't hurt the parents as well to have that kind of heart too when they intercede. Because God hears those types of prayers. And he'll answer them in his time. What a valuable asset to have somebody in your life devoted to pray for you. Especially if you know it's grandma and grandpa. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to this is kind of the end of the phases of life series. We've been through singlehood to, to marriage to, to parenting. Now this last one with grandparenting. May God help us, regardless of whatever stage in life we are, to bring him glory and honor, to live out our lives according to his plan so that we can be fruitful and make an